Now, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Crop Aphid Identification and Management, brought to you by Local Land Services Central West and Central Tablelands in collaboration. This webinar is part of the Central West LLS Ag Services ADAPT project. This project is supported through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. I'm Rowan Leach, the Mixed Farming Advisor with Central West LLS, and together with my colleague Liz Davis from Central Tablelands LLS, We've invited the experts from Caesar Australia to present on aphids and their significant impact on agriculture in the southeast of Australia. This is part of a series of webinars Caesar will present on behalf of LLS, so keep an eye out for them in the coming months. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'd like to welcome Dr. Lizzie Lowe from Caesar Australia as today's presenter. Lizzie is a senior extension scientist with Caesar and is based in Sydney with sustainable insect management and biodiversity conservation, the core focus of her research. Additionally, we also welcome Dr. Zaritza Juric, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries field crop entomologist based in Tamworth. The RITSA will present on the management strategies currently being advised to producers in New South Wales. I'll now hand over to Lizzie to begin today's webinar. Thanks very much, Rowan. Uh, what we're going to be covering today, I'm going to be talking about basic crop uh, aphid identification, because it's not an easy thing by any means, and a little bit of information about insecticide resistance issues, because this can be a huge uh, impact on how you manage these pests. I'm going to quickly talk about some really cool research that we're doing into alternative management of aphids. And then Zaritza is going to talk about management of aphids in pulse crops in New South Wales with some great examples and a little bit about virus transmission. Um, I will welcome you all to write questions in the chat as well. Um, I've got quite a few links which I'll be putting into the chat and feel very free to write your questions in there. And we will um, come back to them um, at the end of the presentation. So why do we care about aphid identification? They're very, very small and they can be very, very daunting to identify. There's over 150 species in Australia, so it's no wonder that people often find aphids very, very difficult to get the identification right. But it is important. Um, firstly, something that I'll talk about in more detail a bit later is that we do have insecticide resistance in some species, such as green peach aphid. Um, so it's really important to know which species you're dealing with. There are also differences in the damage potential of different species, and some species can transmit viruses, whereas others don't. Um, there's also different damage by different species at different crop stages. So even if you have quite a large uh, infestation of some species, it may not actually result in any economic damage depending on the crop stage. So some of the most important features that we use for identifying identifying aphids are what I'm going to run through quickly with you this afternoon. There's lots of different parts of the appearance, which I'll talk about, but also one of the really, really key things is the host. If you know the host and you know um, a little bit about identification, it's actually much easier to drill down into what species you've got. So a little quick talk about aphids because they're not just small, but they're complicated little critters because they've got lots of different life stages. When they are juveniles, uh, they, these called, called nymphs, they're very, very small um, and they don't have wings. And we've got adults that can be either winged or wingless. Basically, you don't want to be using small juveniles for your identification because they have quite different identification features than the adults sometimes. You also don't want to be using the winged um, adults. So when you're looking at aphid identification, you'll often have all four of these different groups all together, um, but it's best to focus in on the adults. Uh, so the largest ones that you can find uh, without wings. They're the best ones for the identification features, which we're talking about today. So one of the first things that we can look at is body shape. Um, we do have quite a range of different shapes in the aphids, and it's one of the most obvious features as well. So if we use the Russian wheat aphid and the oat aphid as an example, you can see the kind of long spindle shape there of the Russian wheat aphid, which we'll talk a bit more about later. And the oat aphid is quite round and globular and it's quite obvious when you see them next to each other. Obviously not quite so obvious when you've just got one by themselves, but it's a good comparison if you've got multiple species. Secondly, one of the body parts that we can look at on the um, aphid is called the siphunculi, 
or the exhaust pipes um, on the very end of the abdomen of these uh, aphids. And they change quite a lot in color, length and positioning. So if we have a look at the cabbage aphid here, so they've got tiny, tiny little exhaust pipes that don't even reach the end of their body. Whereas the turnip aphid is a little bit longer and you can see these ones here are quite long and come beyond the, the end of the body. Um, so that's another of the identification features that we'll be using to look at the different species. I should say this is just me going through all the features and then we'll get into what, what different types of species. So don't worry if you don't know a cabbage aphid from a turnip aphid at this stage. The other part at the end of the body is the core. It's basically the little tail at the end of the aphid. And you can see in this video here, this aphid has a, a bifurcate, so two part tail, and this one has a longer tail. Uh, again, different colors and different shapes in different species of aphid. The antennae can also be a really good diagnostic feature. So you can just see the example here of a very short antennae aphid and a longer one. Um, but it's also very, very difficult to see sometimes. So kind of, you know, that this is what an aphid looks like when you're kind of looking it out at the field. Um, you can almost see the antenna here. There is also something called the tubercle. So this is a tiny little gap um, within the head. But even if you use a, um, a hand lens, like the ones that Liz has sent out to lots of you, um, if you haven't got your hand lens yet, then you can have a chat to Liz. Um, it can be very, very hard to see the tubercle. So we don't talk too much about that, but if you send it into a lab, that's often something that we'll look at as a diagnostic feature as well. Now, if we kind of move away from what they look like, the behavior can be a really important indicator as well. Something like green peach aphid is often much more sparsely distributed. They're not as social. They'll kind of move around um, in individual groups, uh, whereas the cabbage aphid will often clump together. They form quite dense colonies. Um, and they give off a kind of a white powder as well. So we can have a look at how they're moving uh, around the crop and where they're situated um, with other aphids as well. But of course you can also have lots of different species of aphid, which can make it complicated. Feeding damage is another one that we look at. So the Russian wheat aphid is a really good example of this because they have that characteristic long purple um, striping feeding damage that you can see. And a corn aphid causes the leaves to, to twist up. Now, if we actually try and think about um, determining which species we've got, I've now told you what kind of tools we use. Now I'll be actually making the, the comparisons. And the way that we break it down when we do aphid identification is looking at the host plants. Because if we can break it down into what host they're on, then there's usually only a choice of about three or four main species that you're, that you're most likely to be dealing with. We can use this to narrow it right down and make it much easier to identify them because the three or four species within each of these groups do have quite um, major um, physical differences which we can use. And I've got an article from our website that's written up about this as well, which I can put in the chat afterwards that you can refer back to. So if we look at the cereal aphids, we've got oat aphids, corn aphids and Russian wheat aphids, which are most common in cereals. And very superficially, if we just look at them, body shape is the first thing that jumps out at us as being quite different. We've got the Russian wheat aphid, which we call a spindle-like shape. We've got the oat aphid with that big round body, and we've got the corn aphid with a kind of a rectangular shape there. So straight off, just looking at body shape, um, if you've got an aphid on a cereal, that's one way you can use for looking at the differences. If we focus in on the oat aphid, they also have a, um, a, a mark at the bottom of their abdomen down here, it's kind of a reddish patch down at the base. They've got quite blunt siphuncles uh, and medium length um, antennae. If we switch over to look at the corn aphid, they've got a slightly different pattern here. So they have these dark patches at the base of these exhaust pipes and the exhaust pipes are a little bit longer. And instead of being blunt, they've got a tapering tip um, and a very, very oblong shaped body. Russian wheat aphid, which is something that many of you might have come in contact with before, they've got much, much shorter antennae with the little black tips on them. They've got that um, spindle shaped body, which you can see here. Um, they have very, very small siphuncles or exhaust pipes there compared to the other two, which were quite a bit longer. And they often have this kind of dusting of wax, this white waxy substance on them as well. And I will just put in briefly here um, with Russian wheat aphid management, 
Um, a tool that can be really, really useful here is called the Russian Wheat Aphid Threshold Calculator. If you haven't heard of this before, this was um, developed by CESAR as part of a GRDC project. Um, and it is based on the GRDC Russian Wheat Aphid webpage, which again, I will paste in the chat when I'm finished speaking. Um, and we can use this calculator to decide whether it's economically justified to spray for Russian wheat aphid because it varies very much with crop stage and with market price. So what you need to do is for this calculator, you need to input the expected cost of how much it will cost to buy the chemicals to control them, the yield potential and, um, uh, whoops, sorry, uh, and the, uh, the economic, the market price there. And this little calculator will then calculate whether it's actually going to cost you more to control than it, than it would save you um, to leave them in the crop at that stage. So it would be a really useful tool to make sure that you're not spraying if you don't need to. Moving on to pulse aphids, we've got three quite different looking aphids here. Blue-green aphid, cowpea aphid and the pea aphid. These blue-green aphids, um, which we will be talking about a little bit more later because they're quite a significant pest, have very, very long antennae, very, very long siphuncles and a blue to grey green colour. The cowpea aphid is quite distinctive because it's the adults are almost black. The nymphs, uh, so the smaller um, aphids, are kind of a dull grey colour, but you'll often see these black coloured aphids and they do have white banding on the legs, so they're quite distinctive. And the pea aphid, you've got these really funny kind of black knee joints as compared to the blue green aphid. Um, and also uh, they're a slightly different color as well. So that's the main distinguishing feature there. Finally, um, just uh, looking at the um, comparisons here with the um, canola aphids, we have um, the green peach aphid. So this is where the siphuncles can be used as a diagnostic feature, but again, you probably won't see that much when you're out in the field. We've got quite a teardrop shape here and the long um, siphuncles. So if you're looking in canola, then that's one of the main features you're going to be looking at there. Turnip aphid here, they're quite different to some of the others in that they've got these long dark bars across the abdomen. They've got this quite circular round abdomen as well, and you'll see it more when they're side on because they're quite bulbous and they've got these small um, siphuncles, uh, even smaller again, the cabbage aphid, and they're quite a distinctive color as well. But a note of warning, uh, in species such as the green peach aphid, color can be really deceptive because they change color depending on the time of year or what they've been feeding on. Um, so this can be quite a difficult feature to use as diagnostic. So don't always just rely on color. Um, and also it depends on what stage they're at. So yeah, you can see if they've recently shed, then, the, um, then you won't have some of those features like the powdery color or some of those bars. So getting back to talking about green peach aphid, this is one of the really, really key areas where identification is important. Because if you have green peach aphid in a crop and you spray it with the wrong type of insecticide, you may not have any effect of that insecticide if resistance is present. And you may actually make resistance worse as well by developing um, resistance in an area that it, it previously wasn't. So if we look at the data we've got from 2019, we can see that there's quite widespread resistance in green peach aphid to both synthetic pyrethroids and carbamates. So the red little dots there are where there's already resistance and the yellow dots there are where the populations are showing evidence that they may develop resistance. And similar story in organophosphates, quite a few resistant populations, especially in Northern Victoria and central New South Wales, uh, and also to neonicotinoids. So there's a, quite a few centered down in southwestern, southeastern Australia. So definitely something to keep in mind, making sure that you've got the right identification for green peach aphid and that you're not using a spray that we're in an area where the, um, where the resistance has already been developed. Um, sulfoxiflor is a, um, an insecticide that can be used against green peach aphid, but we're also seeing shifts towards um, resistance here. So if you can see, this is um, a figure of what the resistance looks like in Europe, where there is quite high levels of resistance. So you can spray them with very high concentrations and they still have a low mortality. This is what general mortality is like. So this is what you would expect if there was no resistance. And we're already seeing a shift towards more resistant populations in esperance. So it's another one. It's going to take another um, 
and set decide out of our toolkit if this um, develops resistance. So we have to be very wary about how we use them. Now, we do quite a lot of um, research into insecticide resistance at CSER Australia, and we rely on agronomists and growers out in the field who are reporting back to us and sending us samples as well. One of the really important things for green peach aphid is to actually test for resistance. And we have an aphid insecticide resistance testing service. So this is free, and it means that we can stay on top of where the resistance is, and we can report back to people in the field about what kind of levels of resistance are in the populations in their fields. So if you have had a population of green peach aphid which has survived a chemical uh, application or it's suspected that they might be chemical resistant or any other aphid species present when there is a control failure, so it means that you spray and the aphids aren't affected by that spray, we'd really love to hear from you. We would love to get some samples to test. So you can get in contact with me or Samantha Ward. I'll put her um, contacts in the list as well. Uh, and we'd really appreciate anybody that's had any experience in this area to reach out and hopefully provide some samples. So let's talk a little bit more about what's my passion, which is the non-chemical methods of control. Aphids are a really interesting example because there are lots of fantastic biological control um, agents which you can use. These videos here are my favourite because you can see uh, a ladybird at the top really chowing down on some of those aphids and a lacery larvae down the bottom there. We've also got a huge range of parasitoid wasps uh, and lacewing species. So the parasitoid wasps are the ones that will actually lay their eggs inside the aphid and the wasp then grows up inside and then hatches out and killing the aphid. Um, so this is just another reason not to be spraying any old pesticide on your fields because then you'll wipe out the natural enemy um, community as well and you'll have a much um, greater problem with dealing with these aphids over time. Another thing you can do that will really help with aphid management is keeping an eye on the green bridge. So this means two to three weeks before sowing, making sure you've reduced that green bridge around the field. Uh, there are many, many different weeds which are host to, to aphids such as green peach aphid, um, cape weed, ox tongue, wild radish, dockweed and dandelion. So making sure that uh, you're on top of the green bridge and that you don't have too much of a, a refuge there for them, um, then that can really affect the, the numbers of green peach aphid, especially that will come into your crops during cropping season as well. So if we're talking about trying to re limit resistance as much as possible, these are the six key things that you need to be thinking about. Um, making sure you monitor at the critical period, so keeping an eye out for these particular aphids at the right time of year, which is all in the um, resistance strategy down the bottom there. Correctly identifying the pest, making sure you are actually dealing with green peach aphid if that's what it is. Rotating insecticide groups. So if you, instead of just spraying the same um, is, uh, chemical active over and over again, that's when you get resistance because there's just individual ones that will survive and they're the ones that pass the resistance on. Uh, and also using selective insecticide groups where you can. So that means you're using the ones that are targeted, as targeted as possible to the pest which means you allow the, um, the natural enemies to come in and help you with that pest control. Reducing the green bridge, as I talked about, and using cultural management such as beneficials. And again, two other links there, which I'll send out to you. If you have had problems with green peach aphid or resistance, then these are really useful documents for you to have a look through. And finally, I'll just tell you quickly about some really cool and exciting new research that's coming out of CESA and the University of Melbourne at the moment. We have a big research project called the Australian Grains Pest Innovation Program. This is our AgPIP program. And one of the projects within this is about endosymbionts. You probably haven't heard about these before, but they're tiny little bacteria which actually live within the cells of other organisms. In aphids, these endosymbionts, which are living within the cell cells, can actually affect how these aphids respond to things like insecticides, variations in climate, viruses, and predators. So those little cells in there can mean that they survive differently under different conditions. This means that by manipulating these bacteria, you can actually increase susceptibility to insecticides and natural enemies. So if you have a population which has become resistant to a particular pesticide, you can actually treat them with something like an antibiotic that so kills off these endosymbionts, and then the population actually becomes susceptible again. It's a really, really interesting new area of research um, and there's huge potential here as well. It, it's a very complicated system because there's lots of species of aphid and there's lots of species of bacteria and they have lots of different interactions with the environment. 
but it's a really, really exciting way that we could be limiting the amount of insecticides that we use by manipulating the biology of these species. Uh, and like I was saying before, this is a research project that really relies on people in the community helping us out as well. So we really rely on those growers and agronomists that are out there seeing these aphids. And we're always looking for new relationships to test between these aphids and their bacteria, because we've already discovered a, a really wide range of um, examples of where these bacteria can have an effect. So if you do have any old type of aphid that you would feel like sending into us, um, we're discovering new bacteria all the time. So I'd be really excited to hear from you if you would have some that you could send in. And I will stop there and I will stop my sharing and I can put my links into the chat for you and hand over to Saritza. Okay, I hope you can see this. All good, you can hear me? Yeah, all good. Okay, uh, well, um, uh, as you heard, I will uh, tell you today uh, something about uh, aphids, uh, especially aphids in pulse crops and uh, potential virus management. Um, among other aphids that are present in uh, pulses and uh, um, in canola, in all seed crops, uh, uh, there is uh, one uh, aphid that's uh, pretty much uh, important, that's cowpea aphid. Cowpea aphid uh, uh, is uh, primarily a uh, pest of uh, faba beans, um, then lupins, medics, lentils, vetches, but also lucerne, clover, etc. Uh, this aphid uh, is often firstly observed uh, along uh, crop edges, uh, and uh, their if infestation can be patchy inside of paddock. Uh, so uh, uh, this aphid also, as you can see from the uh, picture below, uh, likes uh, tips of uh, young plants, like you can see on this picture with uh, uh, young uh, fava bean plants. Uh, uh, that's actually fava bean plant early emerged in um, uh, autumn last year. Uh, so they usually form uh, colonies uh, on growing tips, uh, and uh, that's the place where you should look for this aphid. So this aphid uh, 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 likes uh, to form uh, patchy colonies, uh, and uh, the best thing is actually uh, before you apply any, um, uh, any management, any uh, spraying, uh, you should actually uh, conduct monitoring in your paddock. Uh, the best way is actually to check uh, at at least five uh, points in your paddock uh, uh, where you will inspect, uh, observe uh, around 20 plants, so altogether 100 plants. Uh, and after you actually find out about uh, their numbers, since they are, uh, they, they are uh, having patchy distribution, then you will know how to apply economic threshold. Uh, why we need to uh, actually uh, spray uh, this aphid in very low numbers, uh, that's because it's uh, very well known as a vector of different uh, uh, viruses, including uh, uh, transmi uh, persistently transmitted and non-persistently transmitted viruses. Uh, uh, if you haven't known uh, the difference, so uh, persistently transmitted viruses uh, are viruses that uh, uh, for which it takes some time for aphid uh, to acquire, to become uh, infective. Uh, and after that, that virus stays in uh, aphid body till uh, end of its life. Uh, on the other side, we have uh, non-persistently transmitted viruses uh, like uh, cucumber mosaic virus, bean yellow mosaic virus, uh, alpha alpha mosaic virus, and PC borne mosaic virus. So most of uh, these viruses named here uh, that cowpea uh, transmit are non-persistently transmitted viruses. And the main thing about that is uh, that the aphid um, uh, carry it uh, uh, for like a few minutes up to a few hours in its body. But the problem is uh, because aphid can transmit it immediately after um, uh, feeding on infected plants. Uh, so after you conduct 
uh, monitoring, you should uh, actually uh, apply threshold. And according to this um, uh, table here, um, it says that uh, in lupins, in New South Wales, you should treat the at first sign of uh, virus infected plants, or uh, if you spot aphid clusters on flower and spike. Uh, I would stay out of uh, uh, this first option because if you see in a, a sign of uh, any virus, if you find any symptom, maybe it could be too late. Uh, so uh, if you spot uh, if you spot any uh, aphids, then you uh, should decide on uh, management, uh, like it says for faba beans in New South Wales. So treat treat very low uh, levels of, of aphids to prevent virus transmission. For chickpeas, there are no uh, threshold established. Um, uh, next aphid that I would like to talk about is pea aphid. Pea aphid is uh, a minor pest of uh, lucerne, uh, for example, an irregular pest of lucerne, but very uh, often uh, is found in uh, pulse crops, uh, also in uh, papa beans, uh, lupins, lentils, but also chickpeas. Uh, you can see on this picture here, this is uh, a chickpea. So uh, pea aphid is not so often found in uh, young chickpea crop, uh, but later uh, during the season can be found if uh, there is nothing uh, more uh, uh, attractive for this aphid, uh, it will stick on chickpea and uh, survive uh, for a very long period. So it's uh, enough uh, if this aphid just stop by and uh, feed for a very uh, short time because this aphid also can transmit again uh, non-persistently transmitted viruses like uh, cucumber mosaic virus, uh, bean, uh, yellow mosaic virus, uh, alpha alpha mosaic virus and pc borne uh, mosaic virus. Also this aphid is very well known of um, uh, uh, um, as a vector of uh, bean uh, leaf roll mosaic, uh, bean leaf roll virus, uh, which is a persistently transmitted virus. Uh, this aphid uh, makes um, uh, damages, uh, different damages on uh, plants, uh, including uh, like uh, curling of uh, leaves uh, or wilting, um, and the uh, plant can uh, go stunting uh, often. Uh, and this aphid is common in spring, but can uh, be found uh, during autumn uh, or early during winter. Um, Again, you should uh, uh, do some scouting uh, if you want to find out uh, what you have in your field. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, inspect at least uh, 20 plants at uh, five uh, sampling points uh, and decide on uh, uh, next step. So if you uh, want to uh, help about that, so you can have here uh, some economic thresholds levels. So for Western Australia, uh, you should provide uh, uh, some, uh, uh, apply some chemical. If you have more than 30% of growing tips infested, uh, or uh, according to New South Wales threshold, uh, uh, you should treat the appearance of cluster of this uh, aphid in flowering plants. Or according to Victoria, uh, if you have 10% of infested uh, uh, plants, um, uh, infested plants in your uh, uh, after you finish your monitoring. Um, next is blue green aphid. Uh, blue green aphid is um, uh, very well known again uh, as a as an aphid that can transmit different viruses and can uh, be present in different crops. So, uh, including including uh, uh, pulses, uh, but also uh, uh, can be found in uh, great numbers uh, in uh, lucerne, in pasture, subflower, etc. Uh, this aphid can be found in canola also. That's why uh, we developed, yeah, uh, we have developed the uh, economic threshold for canola too. Uh, this aphid doesn't come in uh, big clusters. You, you, you won't find it in big clusters like, like um, uh, cow pea aphid or pea aphid. Um, but uh, uh, still, it can be present in big numbers uh, in all these uh, crops, uh, including uh, uh, in uh, uh, chickpea. So that's really rare to find uh, blue green aphid in chickpea. But as you can see in this picture, we found it um, on uh, a wild relative of chickpea, Caesar echinospermum, uh, in really uh, big colonies uh, in our site here in Tampa. 
so be aware that uh, all these aphids are pretty much uh, uh, capable for adapting different conditions, different hosts, uh, and uh, they can actually choose from a uh, uh, very great variety of different uh, hosts because most of them are polyphagous uh, species that uh, I'm telling about. Um, uh, this uh, uh, aphid um, uh, is, um, uh, uh, we, we have developed an yeah, uh, economic threshold uh, for canola in New South Wales. If uh, uh, more than 50% per, per, of plants are infested, uh, you should apply uh, chemicals. Uh, or in, uh, according to Western Australia, if more than 20% of plants are infested, um, uh, or um, uh, um, uh, for lupins, uh, you should treat uh, first at uh, first indication of uh, virus infected plants or first appearance of aphid clusters on flowering sp uh, spikes. In Victoria, they say uh, for faba winds that you should uh, apply uh, chemical um, chemicals if you uh, find 10% of plant being infested, or in Lucerne, uh, if you find in your sweep net uh, uh, around 100 up to 400 aphids in five meter sweeping. Uh, for chickpeas and lentils, there are no thresholds available at this stage. Um, next is uh, green peach aphid. Uh, Lizzie um, uh, said uh, lots of things about green peach aphid, so uh, I don't want to repeat that, but that's very uh, highly polyphagous uh, species that can at attack different uh, crops, uh, including uh, all seed crops, uh, 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 lupins, pulses, uh, broadleaf weeds. That's the biggest problem because uh, this uh, uh, aphid uh, has a very wide host range, um, uh, including yeah these uh, uh, weeds like uh, cape weed, marshmallow, or wild radish, uh, wild turnip. All these uh, weeds are uh, host plants for this aphid, which uh, makes uh, our uh, work around managing it uh, more difficult. Um, uh, this aphid is also very well known as um, uh, a very good virus vector, uh, so uh, it can uh, transmit different viruses, including uh, turnip yellow virus, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, but also turnip mosaic virus, cucumber mosaic virus, PC born mosaic virus, so this aphid can uh, transmit both, again, non-persistently transmitted and persistently transmitted viruses. Uh, the biggest problem is, of course, uh, uh, Lizzie uh, already talked about that because it has developed resistance uh, on different chemicals. Uh, so uh, that that that's uh, that add, add additional pr uh, pressure uh, on us uh, if we want to actually uh, um, uh, if we want to manage this aphid. Uh, this aphid um, uh, uh, for this aphid we don't have uh, economic economic threshold uh, developed, uh, but still uh, that doesn't uh, stop you for uh, uh, to actually go in the field and uh, start the yeah, monitoring. Uh, this species uh, can be found usually on underside of, uh, on backside of leaves uh, and doesn't form colonies like in clusters like uh, we saw in pictures with uh, P. aphid or uh, cow P. aphid, uh, but it can come in really high numbers um, uh, if we do not manage it on time. So please again do scouting on time uh, and find it uh, usually on backside of leaves. Uh, the thing that I would like to mention uh, here is uh, aphid that's uh, pretty new uh, for uh, Australians uh, and for faba bean um, growers. So that's uh, Megura crassicauda. Uh, we call it faba bean aphid. Faba bean aphid uh, is found uh, in uh, Australia in uh, 2016. Uh, in Sydney suburb. Uh, after that, in 2017, we found it uh, in Tamworth, uh, in Riza, and then for um, in 2018 and 19, uh, during uh, two drought years, uh, when we actually had very few commercial fava bean crops, we couldn't find it in that uh, in these few uh, commercial fava bean crops uh, in Liverpool Plains. Um, and we were hoping that actually uh, this aphid didn't establish in Australia, uh, but um, uh, that was not uh, uh, actually uh, what happened. So uh, next year in uh, July 2020, we found it in uh, Grafton um, on faba beans. 
Uh, later on, same year, we found it uh, in uh, Liverpool Plains, so in Northwest New South Wales, then um, uh, in, um, uh, again, back in uh, Sydney uh, suburb, uh, uh, we found it on faba bean crop in woolly pod wedge, uh, and also in gardens. Uh, and uh, there, were, there were also a few positive from coming uh, uh, from Mittagong and uh, cent Central uh, New South Wales. So apparently this aphid is pretty much uh, spread across New South Wales. And uh, there are some uh, data that it's actually present uh, in Victoria too, uh, but I don't have official confirmation on that. Uh, the, uh, last month, uh, this aphid was found in Ipswich in uh, Queensland. So uh, obviously this aphid can be uh, stopped. It's pretty much established. Uh, the thing that you can do, you can um, uh, find it. Uh, if you find something suspicious looking like, like uh, these aphids on these pictures. So they are pretty much distinctive and easy uh, to recognize. They have uh, uh, intensive red eyes, dark head, uh, dark legs, dark cauda and uh, siphunculus. So it's pretty easy to distinguish it. If you find something like that, make a picture, send it uh, to me or anyone in Caesar. I know that uh, 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 Julia Severi was doing some uh, identification with this aphid also. So um, uh, uh, whoever you want to contact that, uh, no problem. Just uh, let us know um, how far distribution of this aphid uh, is uh, at yeah, uh, this stage. Uh, this aphid, uh, we, we uh, conducted some research on this aphid. This aphid um, uh, has preference for faba beans uh, in Australia, uh, also for vetches. So we found it in faba beans, uh, in woolly pod vetch, in uh, uh, also likes uh, 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 common vetch, uh, uh, common pea, lentils, um, uh, lucerne and subflower. Uh, are um, alternative hosts, so they support limited reproduction, uh, and um, uh, they can support uh, like reproduction uh, more than two weeks, which is more than enough for this aphid to make uh, big colonies and start to spread. And also the biggest uh, problem uh, is because um, yeah, it can also transmit viruses. We did some uh, study uh, with uh, non-persistent transmitted virus, uh, which is PC-borne mosaic virus and persistent transmitted virus, which has been leaf roll virus. So both viruses uh, were um, you know, successfully transmitted from faba beans to faba beans uh, with help of this aphid, unfortunately. Uh, so yeah, uh, just keep monitoring your crop uh, uh, because so far this uh, aphid is established, can form really dense colonies. Uh, and um, uh, um, uh, usually it's found again in patches, can infest all uh, uh, parts of plants, so stems, leaves, uh, even pots at the end of season. But the good thing is uh, because this aphid is manageable, uh, pyramid carb uh, uh, acts very well on this aphid. Um, uh, and all these um, uh, outbreaks that happened that I was talking about, uh, we managed it uh, with pyramid carb. So good luck with that. Um, since I'm speaking about viruses, uh, I would like to that, uh, just to point out uh, uh, some um, uh, symptoms uh, uh, of uh, different viruses in pulse crops uh, and uh, in canola, just to point out what you should look for when you are in uh, your paddock. So, uh, for example, turnip uh, yellow virus. Uh, here on this picture on canola, um, uh, it's, uh, it causes uh, leaf distortion uh, and uh, uh, comes with like purple or reddish uh, uh, yellow leaves, uh, the, uh, discoloration, etc. Those are symptoms. Uh, and uh, stunting also could uh, come uh, together with all these symptoms. So turnip yellow virus is persistently transmitted virus. And the most uh, important vector is um, uh, green pitch aphid. Um, uh, uh, 
other viruses, for example, alpha alpha mosaic virus, uh, being yellow mosaic virus, they are non persistently transmitted virus. And these two viruses are viruses that we found uh, uh, quite often in faba beans last year. So uh, alpha alpha mosaic virus, like you can see on this picture with uh, chickpea, uh, is uh, actually mean uh, source uh, is coming from Lucerne. Uh, but Lucerne, Lucerne doesn't, show, doesn't show any symptoms. Uh, in um, uh, other plants, in other pulses, you can uh, find uh, yellow uh, mosaic developing or even uh, necrosis in, um, in uh, chickpea. Uh, being yellow mosaic virus uh, is uh, um, uh, characteristic by its uh, yellowing, uh, uh, rain yellowing, like you can see again on this picture. Uh, and um, uh, uh, often uh, comes with, with uh, 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 I don't know, some uh, different yellow patterns, not only uh, uh, that are tracked with, with the main veins. Uh, being leaf row virus, uh, apart for yellowing, uh, you can see here on this picture upward the uh, leaf rolling, which is uh, one of most important uh, characters. All these uh, uh, characters can differ depending, depending on season, depending on, on uh, plant species, uh, host species. So uh, uh, all these symptoms are pretty much, yeah, even though on this picture, it looks uh, quite distinctive, it's not uh, like that. Uh, that's why uh, I would uh, suggest uh, all of you, if you have any problems with, uh, uh, if you spot something uh, looking similar to these uh, pictures, please send it to uh, uh, Tamword or anywhere else. Here in Tamworth, um, uh, Jop Van Loor with his team, he uh, conducts uh, uh, analysis, uh, which will help you actually to uh, find out which virus you have in your crop. Uh, why I'm telling uh, this uh, is because, for example, in this picture you have bean leaf roll virus, and here is soybean dwarf virus, which looks pretty much similar to to uh, previous one, and then uh, subterranean cover stunt virus. So they are pretty much uh, uh, could be uh, um, exposing uh, similar symptoms. So yeah, just uh, um, contact your one lure and uh, pack example adequately send it to us. Uh, for for detail identification. Uh, I would like just to follow up on numbers of aphids that we found uh, last year and this year in uh, pulse crops and canola in uh, this region. So last year uh, we had quite great numbers of uh, aphids uh, in uh, almost all of our sites. So if you can see uh, numbers were coming up to 2000 uh, aphids uh, per square meter. Uh, so uh, uh, these numbers uh, were quite high even for normal year, uh, and especially, especially they were high comparing to uh, this year, so 2021, when where we had quite low number of aphids in our yellow sticky traps. You can see that uh, 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 scale here and here is quite different, so it's three times uh, more here. Uh, as, uh, we found quite uh, great numbers in uh, 2021, in, especially in faba bean crops, but also in um, uh, chickpea uh, and lucerne, uh, comparing to 2021 when we had uh, quite low numbers. Uh, what we found, uh, what we uh, did found, uh, find, uh, actually we find uh, in 2021 um, uh, great numbers of PAFID and cow PAFID, which are known as good virus vectors. Uh, uh, comparing again uh, with 2021, 20, uh, when we had uh, pretty low numbers of these two aphids, uh, and uh, only uh, in high numbers we found the foxglove aphid in Lucerne and Canola, and foxglove aphid is known as very poor virus vector. So uh, in 2020, uh, in 2020, we had uh, quite a uh, big uh, number of positive examples and quite great uh, outbreaks, especially west of Mori, uh, with uh, uh, faba beans uh, samples being infected with bean yellow mosaic virus and uh, alpha, uh, alpha mosaic virus, both non-persistently transmitted virus, and low numbers of bean leaf roll virus we found in uh, these uh, samples. Comparing to 2021, uh, we had almost none 
positives in our uh, examples collected uh, from the same, um, uh, same area. Uh, so very low uh, number of positive examples in 2021. Why uh, that happened? So uh, in 2020, um, after two years of uh, drought, uh, January and February rains uh, in Northwest uh, New South Wales actually triggered uh, emergence of pasture legumes, uh, which were actually, actually really good hosts uh, for uh, aphids to start to multiply. So uh, these summer rains provided, yeah, uh, really good um, uh, hosts for uh, aphids. Uh, and with full soil, uh, soil profiles, we saw the um, faba beans very early in season which was a great opportunity for, for this aphid to uh, move early in season in fava beans and make great problems in uh, fava bean crops. Uh, so uh, as part of that, uh, 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 we had uh, uh, this kind of uh, problems in uh, paddocks, especially west of Mori. Uh, and these uh, uh, actually uh, infestation, these, these infections uh, become a uh, really good uh, source for later uh, sown crops like chickpeas. Uh, and um, uh, these infections were spread across uh, whole year. So first part, part of year was really uh, uh, um, favorable uh, for aphid to multiply. Uh, conditions were uh, really great, mild conditions, uh, which supported the uh, aphid uh, uh, and uh, virus transmission across whole year. Uh, on the contrary, uh, with that, uh, in 2021, uh, we had very cold uh, and wet conditions. So autumn was cool and wet. Uh, and even though we had full soil, uh, soil uh, profiles uh, and early soil uh, crops, uh, actually, uh, we didn't have uh, perfect conditions for aphid uh, to, to uh, establish uh, in our crops uh, because we had very cool days and cool nights. And especially uh, in uh, April, uh, we had early frost. All these conditions actually affected the aphids um, uh, and uh, uh, they didn't manage to transmit uh, viruses. Uh, we tried to sample uh, aphids uh, around paddocks and inside of paddocks. Uh, we, we found very low numbers and we uh, conducted the TBA, uh, uh, TBIA uh, tests and found very low uh, virus pre uh, presence. So, um, yeah, that's really good result uh, because um, uh, uh, crops are looking uh, really good and yield uh, already. This is uh, uh, somewhere uh, like uh, beginning of uh, spring. We had uh, quite great uh, crops in this region. Uh, and yeah, of course, healthy and go good crops uh, are more likely to be resist to virus infections. That was uh, uh, additional uh, advantage uh, uh, for us. Uh, at the end, I would just like to maybe uh, repeat some of uh, uh, virus control measures, uh, which uh, already uh, were mentioned before, uh, but uh, uh, I want to point out that uh, there is no option uh, uh, to actually control uh, virus. Uh, so no curative option, only preventive, uh, preventive uh, measures can be uh, done. So that's why we should uh, think about that and control weeds uh, and, and um, sell some voluntary crops on time. Uh, also, um, you know, avoid sowing uh, close to inoculum source like lucerne paddocks or near uh, voluntary plants. Uh, use uh, high quality of seeds uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, um, try to use some, um, uh, some options like uh, resistant varieties if they are available. Uh, breeding of uh, canola and pulses for uh, turnip yellow resistant is being undertaken as far as I know, but there are no resistant varieties uh, at the moment. Uh, then, for example, sowing canola and pulse crops in cereal uh, standing stubble could uh, limit aphid uh, colonization. Um, and the retaining st stubble um, uh, apparently uh, could reduce uh, aphid landing rates, according to some results from Western Australia, uh, because, uh, yeah, uh, uh, in some way it reflects uh, um, uh, aphids uh, and uh, actually their ground attracts them more than. than uh, uh, retaining stubble. Uh, 
Uh, rotation of uh, canola impulses, of course, is one of the main main, um, uh, um, uh, main control options, preventing control options. Uh, Sowing early uh, to establish a yeah, uh, canopy closure, uh, to establish yeah, good crops and uh, possible uh, uh, option that uh, uh, canopy closure will shade uh, uh, out some big plants could be uh, that could be uh, um, a source of some uh, um, yeah viruses or something like that. Removing uh, virus infected plants could be also an option for you uh, and. Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, uh, crop monitoring, which I pointed out a few times, uh, crop monitoring constantly. Uh, and after you establish uh, 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 representative numbers in your crop, then apply insecticide. Uh, about uh, insecticide, um, uh, you can uh, also apply some um, uh, seed uh, treatment. Uh, uh, on, uh, just on that, I would like to uh, mention that we conducted uh, some research. Uh, uh, we, we did some glasshouse study on imidacloprid seed treatment. Uh, and uh, apparently, uh, for uh, only for cowpea aphid and pea aphid, Apparently, it was not affecting uh, on first day, as you can see from these uh, you know, results here. We had pretty much yeah, uh, the same numbers after uh, first day, uh, but uh, it was quite good and effective uh, on th uh, third, seventh, and 14 days uh, of observation. Um, uh, seed treatment could be um, ineffective uh, for uh, non-persistent transmitted viruses, uh, like I was uh, discussing before, uh, because non-persistent transmitted virus can, uh, are, uh, viruses that uh, are um, you know, transmitted immediately uh, after aphid was feeding on, um, uh, on, on your plant. So that's why there is no option uh, to actually stop uh, uh, aphid for, from transmitting non-persistent transmitted viruses, uh, but you can slow down uh, their uh, colonization uh, in your paddock. Uh, and of course, at the end, uh, just pay attention uh, that many natural enemies of aphids are present in your paddock. Uh, so they are hoverflies, lacewings, lady beetles, uh, and all other uh, beneficials. So they are very much important uh, uh, for us. Uh, uh, they, are, they, are to, uh, they are good guys uh, who will uh, balance uh, um, uh, actually in between uh, yeah, pests uh, and uh, actually your uh, option to use some uh, of insecticide to uh, uh, slow down their reproduction. Yeah, that's about it uh, from me. Uh, at the end, just uh, thank you from me, Lizzie, and all others. Thanks very much, Teresa. That was wonderful. Um, really, really good coverage of some of the issues that you face in New South Wales with the aphids that you might be seeing uh, in your local areas. Uh, one final thing is that Liz did manage to send out some um, hand lenses to those of you who um, provided your addresses. And if you haven't received one already, Liz has given your de her details there. You can get in touch with her. I think she'll send them out to everybody who registered uh, anyway. Is that right, Liz? You're on. Yeah, there you go. Only people that provided details yeah. that were interested. Yeah, fantastic. Um, uh, and because those lenses are a really great tool, with, especially when you're looking at tiny little things like insects um, and aphids in particular, uh, we would love to see a photo of you using it. So um, if you've got a photo that you've taken with your hand lens or a photo of you using the hand lens, please send it over to Liz. She loves to see insect photos. She loves to see people taking photos of insects. Um, and we hope that this encourages you to get out into the field and do some aphid identification as well. We do have a quick minute for questions if anybody's got a burning question. Otherwise, if you have aphids you would like to send to us, please do get in touch with me because they're very, very valuable to our research. Um, and otherwise, you're welcome to get in contact with us um, in the contact sheet that Liz will send around to you. We'll send a copy of the recording and all links that um, have been mentioned in the presentation today. Okay. I didn't see anything written to the chat. So thanks very much for coming today and um, we'll see you next time, hopefully. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Bye.